Hi there, and welcome to the show. This is the College Problems Podcast, breaking down the more serious and lighthearted issues students everywhere are facing. And we're doing it mostly from a journalism, personal safety, and a young professor's perspective. I'm one of those professors. My name is Dan Reimold. Read my book, Journalism of Ideas, or check out my blog, College Media Matters. I'm joined today, as always, by the lovely and talented Christina Gaudio, a personal safety educator, victims advocate, and victimology professor. So we're going to talk today about pajamas in class and firearms on campus. Let's start with PJs. In a past story published in the Chicago Maroon, the student newspaper at the University of Chicago, a student writes, quote, the beauty of pajamas is that you can peel off your clothes after a long day and snuggle up in pajamas that are unsullied by the outside world. But when pajamas start leaving the house and become an alternative to clothes, it opens up a whole new can of worms. And of course, this can of worms becomes especially fun and debate-worthy when the PJs start popping up in public on college campuses, specifically being worn in mass by students, including to class. So Chris, what, what do you think about this? Will you cop to maybe once or twice in your college days, or maybe more than that, sporting PJs in the, the, the public sphere, in the cafeteria, maybe in class even? I, I will admit as an undergrad, uh, especially for my morning classes, there were times where I wore pajamas to class uh, in the cafeteria. But now let me preface this by saying that some of us went to a single sex college, so there wasn't as much of a concern with guys seeing us. So we would go to breakfast or lunch in our pajamas if we didn't have classes that morning or things of that nature. But uh, I remember a professor uh, stating in one of my classes when I was a freshman that pajamas in class means you don't take enough pride in yourself to consider yourself as someone who's professional, so you're not dressing to the part. So I remember that sitting there listening to that and going, okay, I think I'm done with this. And that to me is, is one of the more interesting parts that it bleeds into what I see from the professor's perspective as a larger kind of embedding of informality in the university process where, and I see it from the, hey, what's up greetings from students and emails that they'll send me to the idea of walking into class 10 minutes late with the earbuds attached to their ears um, or zoning out and taking texts during class to even the idea of maybe when they might um, you know, email in the middle of the night and expect a reply or the parents, as we've talked about in a past podcast, getting involved. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things are bleeding into the sphere and kind of taking away the professional angle of, you know, what's supposed to be the student professor relationship or just the idea of how you're supposed to treat college. I think PJs are part of that. Is it a bad thing though? I mean, hey, the students are paying for their education or getting the scholarship to attend. Should they have to show up in a full, you know, ball gown or tux just to attend a 9 a.m. class? No, no one's saying they have to dress up. But at the same time, I mean, I'll ask you the question. Obviously, when you get up in the morning and you muscle around and you hang around your PJs, how much better do you feel once you put clothes on and you say, okay, now I'm ready to address my day? I know for myself, if I stick around in PJs too long, I find myself being like, I don't really want to go out today. I really don't want to do anything. But if I get up and I get dressed, okay, I'm ready to greet my day, I'm ready to get going, let's get on with things. And I feel like I have more energy and I'm more interested in what I'm doing. I, I absolutely agree. I think the, the informality um, educational perspective also bleeds in to the idea of students' emotional and social health. Mm -hmm. And the notion of treating, for example, a random Wednesday in the middle of the semester as worth waking up for. Mm -hmm. You know, and something that one day, very soon once you graduate, you're also going to have to treat as a professional nine to five work day. And thus, this is something that you probably, whether it's for practice or for show, to actually, you know, do your work and show up to class and, and as you mentioned, get the full college experience feeling in that moment and not simply, oh, I'm going to go struggle, you know, trudge there, sit in the back of class with my head down and then come back to sleep after eating, you know, a day old pizza <laughs> is that, you know, in some ways that's part of the college experience and that's as, you know, as, as idealistic and iconic as anything else, but it's not really taking advantage of what you're supposed to be paying for and, and getting the most out of. So I agree. I think that warm shower, the cup of coffee and getting halfway decent dressed is part of that experience, but still the students call. It is. It is a student's call, but I'm finding more and more professors that I deal with are not allowing it in their classes. And I don't allow it in my class. I have a night class and I don't allow it. Uh, it's one of those situations that I'm here. I made my way to get here. I'm standing in front of you and I'm dressed. There's absolutely no reason that at the end of the day that you can't be dressed and be ready to sit down and have a conversation with me, sit down and learn. Because I'm not here to babysit you. 
I'm here to teach. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm not sure I've ever thought about the idea of needing to have a dress code. Maybe I've been lucky with um, the students I've taught or the places I've taught, certainly teaching at a Florida uh, university for a while. It'd be more kind of the, the lack of clothing at times coming from the, you know, the pool on campus more than, you know, <laughs> stumbling out of their, their dorms um, in their PJs. But, um, you know, it, it is an interesting idea that I do think bleeds back to your original point, which is, yes, I as the professor may not literally call the student up and say, this is not going to fly in my class, but would probably think a little bit less of that student unless this was truly like, Sarah, John, what are you doing? It's week seven. You've usually been on the ball here. Is everything okay? But beyond that, yeah, I would think less kind of like sitting in the back and not raising your hand and participating. I understand the student that comes to class with the cold, not feeling well, and want to dress relaxed. I get that. I'm talking about the person that perpetually comes every day or comes every week in the same pajama band, pajama pant bottoms that I've seen all semester. Is this though a now it's you know it's 2014, it's you know 21st century everything that used to be out of fashion is now in chic or so fashion forward that we of course as the slightly older folks don't get it are pajamas or you know sweatpants so in and cool and hip are we just behind the times in that or is no, it no. still just you know it's no. dirty stuff struggling out of bed no it just okay. it comes down to if you can put a pair of pajama pants on girls can put a pajera, pair of yoga pants on like <laughs> come on really let's get on with this <laughs> and I, I do think one last thing to, to think about with it 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 is funny to think about what you mentioned as um, someone who happened to go to a single sex education institution for your undergrad mm -hmm. and thus, at least on a majority of levels, not thinking about the boys or having to, you know, dress up in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, although there's certainly, you know, different gender and sexuality issues involved, but in, you know, in yes, general, in talking general. about our heterosexual society. And so it is an interesting idea that even from a social perspective, it's one other thing, you know, just one other, frankly, pressure that students have to think about along with getting to class on time, making sure you're impressing your professor or at least not embarrassing yourself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, making sure you're looking okay for the opposite or same sex and trying to impress and, yes. you know, making sure if you're going to see that crush in the cafeteria or walking around campus that you don't look like you just rolled out of bed. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So definitely, you know, the, the PJs are an issue due to their prevalence on campus. Firearms have become increasingly and, and more vocally an issue on campus for the opposite reason, that mm -hmm. more and more they are not at least legally allowed to be on campuses. What's going on here with, is it gun-free zones or outright bans in communities that take you know, colleges into account? What's happening here? Uh, there's a lot of debates going on um, through legislation, through states, through just casual conversations going on on campuses. Uh, the aspect is the, a lot of college campuses and universities are gun-free zones. What we mean by that is no concealed carry firearms are allowed on campus. So students can't have them, faculty can't have them, staff can't have them. And a lot of these issues have been raised, especially since the 2007 shooting in Virginia Tech. You know, we've had other college campus shootings, we've had other high school campus shootings, but I think Virginia Tech has really struck a lot of chords because Virginia, that state, does allow concealed carry, but they allow their student colleges and campuses to make the decision on whether or not they will allow firearms on the campus. And there were actually plenty of students who attended that campus who have concealed carry licenses and permits, I apologize, concealed carry permits on campuses, but they can't and were not allowed to use and have those firearms on campus that day. So this is obviously an issue you're very passionate about. Educate me as someone who's coming from the outside of this, mm -hmm. whose first thought might be, these are 18 to 22 year olds surrounded by a lot of students in the thick of things, possibly not sober at all times, leaving doors open in their dorm rooms, possibly getting irrationally angry at a roommate or an ex. Why is it a good thing for students to have these weapons on campus? Doesn't it lead to more trouble at times? Well, the one thing I will address is it's not a weapon unless you're using it against somebody else. It's a firearm. It is something there for protection. And it's something there for you to defend you or someone else you, if you had to, God forbid. Anybody that's ever truly fired a firearm and is a responsible individual knows the power of it, understands it, and respects it. I'm not talking about somebody who just gets it and carries it around like a joke to show people off. I truly believe that they need to be trained, understand it, have their permit, and then be allowed to carry it on campus. Would you feel comfortable as a professor in a class knowing or maybe even the opposite not knowing but wondering if one of your students and maybe even the one you just gave a c to possibly is packing at that moment because i'll be packing too so it wouldn't bother me 
But at the same time, I look at it from, I'm more worried about the students that are in front of me. I'm worried about the person coming in off that campus or another student on that campus who is enraged and is coming after my students in the aspect. I may have to put my life on the line for them. The last thing I want to do is be a human shield to block my students because I don't have a firearm to protect myself or them. When you see the the fallouts from especially the mass shootings in the U.S., but even on the day-to-day level, um, you know, the victims of gun violence and mm-hmm. the perpetrators mm-hmm. who, you know, unfortunately are... Um, uh, you know, leading this to be a, a massive problem here in the States. There's always the talk of places, for example, like in Europe, where the rates of um, firearm violence, deaths, uh, you know, all sorts of situations are extremely low, it, seemingly in large part because they are basically banned across the entire spectrum of those countries, like the UK, for example. Wouldn't that be a a pretty prime example of why we wouldn't want more weapons on campuses, but less can be better for everyone. No. And again, I ask in the spirit of trying to get educated. No, that's fine. At the end of the day, the gun control laws that are out there, the only people that they're doing anything and punishing are the responsible gun owners. Because honestly, not one criminal out there is going to follow those laws. Mm. They're going to get their firearm whichever way they want to get it, whether it's a black market or through somebody or through stealing it. They're going to get it and they're going to have it. And the innocent person who has a permit is not going to be able to defend themselves and what's going to happen in that situation. And we're certainly living in a post-9-11 society in which the idea of a a mass group of people, the Good Samaritans, the the observers, eyewitnesses. Mm-hmm. There's certainly gaps in this when you see yes. you know certain you know students being abducted and nothing was done. But in general, we seem to be living in that time where people are going to do something and step up. Yes. Have have it has it been proven that for example in situations in which people were able to have uh, concealed carry permits, they had weapons on the scene. These are the the good guys. When these things happen, are they able to come in and save the day? There's a magazine that I get from being a member of some uh, firearm organizations that comes in and on the one of the first or two pages, front pages of that magazine, they have actually news clips, articles of concealed carry success stories. And it talks about, you know, the person in their home, the person that saw somebody getting robbed by gunpoint that are coming to and helping these other people. And I admit this is not stuff that I see as a CNN watcher or a mainstream media observer and you're all not, the time. And you're not yeah. going to. Yeah. And yeah. That's the biggest thing I'm trying to make people realize is that gun-free zones are allowing your students to be sitting ducks. All they are is just target practice because they can't defend themselves. And there are so many students out there that have been born, raised, trained on firearms, and all they want to do is be able to have it to keep themselves safe. There was a case of a young woman that was attending Dartmouth University. She was being stalked for years. Mm -hmm. Her person went to jail, and she's fearful that this person's up for uh, for parole and can get out wanted to be able to bring her firearm that she had a permit for onto campus. Mm -hmm. She was not allowed. Dartmouth said, no, I'm sorry, we have a weapons ban on campus and that includes everything. And she said, well, how are you going to protect me? And they said, well, you can call campus safety. And nothing wrong with the police and campus safety, but when seconds count, they're minutes away. And and to be clear, because in most cases, campus safety doesn't carry more than a taser or a stun gun or, mm-hmm. or pepper spray. And even that gets them in trouble sometimes. Yes. Remember the, yes. the University of California. And that's very true. Do you, do you also see it as being a positive for those security force personnel to, yeah. to have weapons? I, I, yeah. I have no problem with them being properly trained to be able to you know, carry firearms on, their, on the campus if they pass what they need to do. But at the end of the day, how... I'll hear this from my own students. There's not enough of them. There's, they're not around when they need them. So at the end of the day, it really becomes about your person, about you. You need to be able to protect yourself. You need to be able to protect the people around you. Because at that instant when you're calling 911, that person's still coming at you. You're, you know, you're someone who follows um, the related issues here. And so I'm curious, as I certainly read a lot about the amount of things that students are uh, bringing onto campuses illegally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everything from drug paraphernalia and alcohol to, you know, pets, uh, you know, iguanas and dogs and things in the dorms. <laughs> Would you hazard a guess or do you know for sure from things you read, even anecdotally, that guns are a part of, uh, you know, the underbelly of, of campus being hidden under the bed or maybe in off campus spots more than we recognize or might realize? I wouldn't want to comment on yeah. what that is, but I can't say I would be surprised. Okay, okay. 
it's just like anything else. I mean, if someone truly believes strong enough in it, there's not going to be anybody that's going to stop them. And so bottom line, because I thinking about it from the journalist perspective, um, you know, one of the biggest factors here would be winning the media game with this. And the, the first thing I see is maybe along with a hero uh, scenario or two, mm -hmm. someone will get angry at a professor, have, you know, a mental health issue mm -hmm. and have that permit to have the concealed weapon on campus and shoot someone, probably the professor at point blank in their office. And suddenly the media war is lost to the nth degree. I mean, what, okay. what's your thought? And I'm going to turn around and direct exactly what you said, mental health. We have a huge mental health problem in this country. If somebody has a mental health break in that moment, they probably have something in the past. That is part of some of the checks that go on with mental health and firearms. If that's done and that person, and that does happen, it, anything can happen. It comes down to that. Anything can happen, but it's going to be more the people that are suffering. The innocent ones are what we need to focus about and the people that want to protect themselves. That's what it needs to be addressed. And campuses need to realize that, it's not just a person swinging it around who wants to show off with their friends. It's the, I'm actually afraid because if somebody comes into this room, I've got one exit, which is the door, and maybe a couple windows that I can't get out of. I'm fully trapped in a classroom, and there's a gun pointed at me, mm -hmm. and there's nothing I can do because I'm not allowed to carry my permitted concealed carry firearm on campus. And definitely a tough issue, and it can be a divisive one, but it's hard to, you know, to argue with the notion of that. We obviously... Many of us would wish even we were there in those moments, you know, with the ability to help some of the students at, you know, college level and, and below who have lost their lives in that terrible situation. And there's one other point I do want to make. Uh, I know that some colleges, some campuses, high schools have brought on actual police officers who have firearms onto campus. The one thing I will point out is that from my readings and the education that I've received is that that's the first person they're going to take out is the person that they know has that firearm. So if... In Virginia Tech, there had been the officer with that firearm who was on that campus 24-7. They would have known about them, and that would have been the first person they would have taken out. And so again, so under the rubric of having the legal concealed carry, it's not only potentially then the amount of people, but also the fact that you don't know who it might be, and thus maybe would give that person who might be planning something a moment's pause, or maybe even make them think twice, or exactly. you know, God forbid, you know, to be stopped. Okay. Yes, exactly. So definitely something worth uh, worth taking a closer look at for student journalists or people interested in security and protection issues. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you guys for listening to another edition of the College Problems Podcast. Join us next time.